pollution, smog, and exhaust emissions have been very much in the news for several years now. Unfortunately, very few people fully understand these problems or what it takes to solve them. The reason why carbon monoxide and hydrocarbons are considered undesirable is fairly obvious. The human body and breathing apparatus simply cannot tolerate concentrations of these gases. The undesirable effects of NOx, which is the coined name for oxides of nitrogen, are much less obvious. The main reason for controlling NOx is because it contributes to the formation of smog. But just what is smog? Smog is not smoke. It is not fog. And it is not a combination of the two. Hydrocarbons and oxides of nitrogen are the principal ingredients of smog. When these invisible gases are acted upon by sunlight, a brownish haze called photochemical smog is produced. A concentration of smog is objectionable. It may irritate the eyes, partially obscure the sun, and change the appearance of a green mountainside to a less pleasing brown tone. Fortunately, a genuine smog problem does not exist in rural areas or in most cities. It only occurs in a few isolated metropolitan areas where peculiar atmospheric and terrain conditions trap concentrations of hydrocarbons and oxides of nitrogen in a static, cloud-like layer. The next time you see a cloud of smoke or run into a fog bank, don't make the mistake of thinking it's smog. Unless you live in one of the smog areas, chances are you've never seen the real thing. Next, let's consider the engine operating conditions which produce hydrocarbons, carbon monoxide, and NOx. Hydrocarbons is the name given to a whole family of compounds containing hydrogen and carbon. For example, gasoline is a hydrocarbon, and any unburned or partially burned fuel that comes out of the exhaust pipe is a hydrocarbon. If the engine is fed a too rich fuel mixture, there won't be enough air and oxygen present in the combustion chamber to burn all of the gasoline. As a result, some unburned hydrocarbons will go out the tailpipe. A too lean fuel mixture may also produce an excessive amount of hydrocarbon emissions because the fire in the combustion chamber may go out before all of the gasoline is burned. Here's why that can happen. If the mixture is very lean, the fuel particles may be so far apart that the heat from one particle may not be great enough to reach out and ignite its neighbor. When this happens, the fire in the combustion chamber dies out and the unburned hydrocarbons go out the exhaust. By comparison, with an ideal fuel mixture, the fuel particles are packed close together and each burning particle ignites adjacent fuel particles. Precise ignition timing is also essential to ensure complete combustion and clean exhaust. If the mixture is ignited too soon, the fuel particles may not be packed close enough together at the time of ignition to ensure continuous and complete burning. If ignition is late, the combustion process may not start soon enough to burn all of the fuel before the exhaust valves open. Some of the unburned hydrocarbons will go out with the exhaust gases. Unless the exhaust is very hot and there is enough oxygen present to continue the burning in the exhaust system, the fire will go out before all of the hydrocarbons are consumed. But what about carbon monoxide? Chemically, it is one part carbon and one part oxygen. Carbon monoxide is produced when there isn't enough oxygen present in the combustion chamber to produce harmless carbon dioxide, which has two parts oxygen for one part carbon. Although carburation and ignition timing are essential to complete combustion and clean exhaust, many other engine design features are equally important. Clean exhaust is also dependent upon the right combination of combustion chamber shape, compression ratio, camshaft design, intake and exhaust manifolding, and engine operating temperature. To summarize, a lean mixture is probably best for reducing carbon monoxide emissions. However, a mixture that is too lean for complete combustion will increase hydrocarbon emissions because the fire will go out. A mixture that is on the rich side tends to increase both monoxide and hydrocarbon emissions because there isn't enough oxygen present for complete combustion. An engine that is designed to operate on an air-fuel ratio of about 16 to 1 is theoretically close to ideal from a standpoint of carbon monoxide and hydrocarbon emissions. 
Unfortunately, the solution to the total emission problem isn't quite that simple. Most of the 1973 model engine changes were necessary in order to meet NOx standards without exceeding limits for carbon monoxide and hydrocarbons. So let's consider the NOx problem. As was pointed out earlier, NOx is the nickname for a family of invisible gases that consist of nitrogen and oxygen. About four-fifths of the air we breathe is nitrogen, and about one-fifth is oxygen. The engine uses the oxygen in the air to burn gasoline in the combustion chamber. Normally, most of the nitrogen drawn into the engine is not used or changed. It passes out the exhaust pipe and is returned to the atmosphere. However, if combustion chamber temperatures are very high, some of the nitrogen combines with some of the oxygen to form oxides of nitrogen, or NOx. The temperature required to produce NOx is over 2,000 degrees. For most operating conditions, combustion chamber temperature is well below the critical NOx producing range. As a matter of fact, NOx is produced as a result of brief combustion temperature peaks that occur as a result of some operating conditions. To reduce NOx emissions, these temperature peaks must be eliminated or greatly reduced. One way to reduce combustion temperature is to operate on a very lean mixture. If the amount of fuel in the mixture is reduced, the fire won't get as hot and there will be an excess of oxygen in the combustion chamber. The lean mixture approach to NOx control is fine and since there is an excess of oxygen available, it also reduces carbon monoxide emissions. However, the lean mixture results in two other problems. As was pointed out earlier, very lean mixtures don't burn completely. The combustion chamber fire goes out and hydrocarbon emissions increase. Fuel economy suffers because the unburned fuel goes out the tailpipe without producing any power. In addition, very lean mixtures result in unsatisfactory performance. Very rich mixtures can also be used to keep combustion chamber temperatures down so that NOx production is held within acceptable limits. The rich mixture solution to NOx control presents even more emission problems. An excessive amount of fuel in relation to the amount of air and oxygen available results in greater carbon monoxide emissions. A rich mixture also increases hydrocarbon emissions and decreases fuel economy. So at the present time, fuel ratio isn't the answer to acceptable NOx emissions. In the 1973 models, the air-fuel mixture flowing through the intake manifold is diluted with small amounts of exhaust gas. The exhaust gas reduces temperature peaks and NOx emissions, but that's only part of the story. Combustion chamber temperatures tend to increase if normal vacuum advance is permitted during acceleration. That's where OSAC, or the Orifice Spark Advance Control System, comes in. OSAC delays the buildup of full distributor vacuum advance by about 15 seconds. This helps reduce temperature peaks and provides additional insurance against excessive NOx emissions during acceleration. However, not allowing the spark to advance can cause the engine to overheat under some operating conditions. To protect the engine against possible damage from overheating, the OSAC system has a coolant temperature bypass valve. This valve provides full vacuum advance if coolant temperature reaches about 225 degrees. Allowing normal ignition advance reduces the amount of heat transferred to the cooling system and increases engine idle speed. As soon as coolant temperature drops back to normal, the OSAC system goes into action again. A detailed story of the OSAC and the EGR systems used on present models was covered in Tech Session 73-1, Cleaner Air System Highlights. But what about drivability and fuel economy? Drivability, in terms of response and performance, is good. A very critical driver may notice a slight decrease in acceleration from the lower speed ranges. A little more throttle opening is required to get the same performance expected from previous engine models of the same size. Two other important factors affecting performance are frequently overlooked. Generally speaking, the 1973 models are heavier than comparable models that are three or four years old. Also, the standard axle ratio specified for current models is usually a lower numerical ratio. In other words, it is a high-speed axle which reduces engine revolutions per mile. This was done to increase engine life and ensure that this year's models will meet emission standards. Although greater car weight and numerically lower axle ratios may reduce acceleration slightly in the lower speed ranges, 
Generally speaking, performance is equal to or better than last year's models in the mid and higher speed ranges. Carburation, fuel distribution, and ignition timing have been calibrated to provide the best combination of low emissions, drivability, and engine life when the entire cleaner air system is operating normally. As a matter of fact, it is unwise as well as illegal to alter or tamper with the operation of any of the emission control systems or devices. Stick to the specifications and you'll find that the 1973 models are both clean and drivable. Even from this all too brief discussion of air pollution, exhaust emissions, fuel economy, drivability and engine life, you can appreciate the complex nature of clean air and clean engines. Our purpose has not been to question the relative merits of the federal emission standards. However, since there are many misconceptions about both the cause and correction of exhaust emissions, it is important for everyone in the dealership to have a basic understanding of the nature of the problems involved. This knowledge will help everyone understand this year's models and the changes that are scheduled for the next few years. And of course, a working knowledge of emission control is particularly important to the mechanics who have the job of keeping the new models both clean and drivable. If you're interested in learning more about the part automobiles play in the total air pollution problem, send for a copy of the booklet, Let's Have Clean Air, But Let's Not Throw Money Away. We also urge you to read this month's reference book, since it goes into greater detail on emissions, fuel economy, and drivability. It even speculates briefly on the effect proposed emission legislation may have on the models you'll be servicing a few model years from now. Try reading it. We think you'll like it.